Greetings, chemists. In this video, we're going to be looking at the way that gases respond to changes in temperature and pressure and volume. And this is going to be related to our talks that we've been about uh, thermal energy. So as a background, we talked about the idea that a molecule is always moving, right? It has some kinetic energy. Whether that's because it's actually linearly moving along or because it's vibrating in place, like with solids, uh, is it doesn't matter. The amount of movement is uh, based on its kinetic energy. So let's talk about a balloon that we fill up with gas particles little gas particles in there and we put them in and those gas particles bounce around inside the balloon they're all going a certain speed and some are going slightly faster than others and some are going slightly slower but there's an average speed and the average speed or the average kinetic energy of those gas particles is what we call the temperature temperature is the average Average, I can totally write, kinetic energy of a sample of particles. And the reason the balloon fills up to a certain size, fills up to a certain shape, is that every time they, they're bouncing around in here and they hit the wall, they apply some force to the wall and the balloon has a certain surface area. So the idea that when they hit, they apply a force over a certain area, that is known as a pressure. So pressure is sort of related to, in this case, the number of gas particles that smack into the walls. So we could say the number of collisions between the gas particles and the wall of the container. <laughs> Related to that, okay? We're not actually counting up each little hit. Now, it, it doesn't matter when they hit each other, right? If this gas particle here bounces off of that gas particle somewhere in the middle of the balloon, that doesn't actually help stretch the balloon out. So we'll say that internal collisions are unimportant, at least with what we would call an ideal gas. So this is, uh, these are all for ideal gases. Ideal gases, um, we say, have no volume. Not volume. Uh, part the, what I mean to say is the particles themselves have no volume. So, uh, uh, and they... Ideal gases, when they hit each other, they don't lose any kinetic energy, or the, the total sum of kinetic energy doesn't decrease. Okay? Uh, so, internal collision is not a big deal. The other is, uh, thing we care about with this balloon is how big it gets, and that's the volume. So the volume is the three-dimensional space occupied by the gas... And we'll also sort of peripherally be interested in the number of gas particles, which we'll use n, lowercase n, is the number. Now, technically, it's the number of what we would call moles of gas, which we haven't discussed yet in this class, but which is related to the amount of particles. A mole is a certain amount of gas particles. It's actually a very large amount of gas particles, but that's okay. The, num the number of particles matters, okay? So all of these four things uh, will affect basically the size of the balloon. And we can do some experiments. So first experiment. We take and we seal the balloon off like this. So the balloon has, and I'm going to do a number of particles that are easy to count. Let's go one, two, three, four, five inside of that balloon. And we have a certain temperature and pressure. And what we do with that balloon is we apply a great, a large pressure to the outside of that balloon. And 
we see what happens. And what we see is this. We see the balloon will actually shrink, if you can do this uniformly, to a smaller size, but it'll still have those five particles inside. After we have, uh, assuming we are under a, a large pressure like this. So that's that pressure squeezes the balloon down to this size. And we ask, why does it do that? So let's think about our initial situation back up here. Up at the starting point, if I look at this balloon, these gas particles are applying a pressure to the inside layer of the wall. Outside, there's a bunch of gas particles as well, right? We, have, we live in an atmosphere, so um, every time they hit, they squeeze outward. Well, every time a gas particle on the outside hits, it squeezes inward. And... And so at some point, what we do is the balloon will fill to a certain size while those arrows out and those arrows in cancel each other out, where they're the same squeeze from both sides. What did we do? We came down here and we applied more squeeze from the outside. We took something in addition to the atmosphere and increased that push. So now the amount pushing out is not the same as the amount pushing in. Now the balloon gets to a smaller size. What's happening now? At a smaller volume, you can imagine this gas particle bouncing around between the walls will actually hit the walls more frequently when they when there's less space than he did when there was more space. Here, if it hit, it took a longer time to bounce into another wall because they're just farther apart. So what went by by squeezing this balloon down to a smaller size, we've actually increased the amount of hits from the inside until the point that the out arrows and the in arrows will cancel each other out. That the forces wind up balanced again, or the pressures wind up balanced again. And so this happens, let's suppose we didn't change the temperature. So let's say temperature constant. And we said we didn't change the number of particles. We said the number of moles of gas was constant. What did we do? We increased the pressure. We increased the pressure. And when we did that, the volume decreased. This is known as an inverse relationship. So we can say pr pr pressure is proportional, that's a proportionality symbol, to the inverse of the volume. This was figured out by a, a chemist whose last name was Boyle, so sometimes this is referred to as Boyle's Law. I'm not super interested that you memorize his name, but I do want you to understand that when you increase pressure, you decrease volume, or when you increase the volume, you decrease the pressure. So the reverse is also true. If I took a balloon and expanded it out to a certain size, I would be decreasing the number of collisions on the inside, so the gas particles would not push as hard, and so the pressure would lower. Right, let's try another experiment, also with a balloon. Let's suppose I do a balloon, same five gas particles inside, and this time I, I don't squeeze extra on it. What I do is I, I put it next to a source of heat. Now, I don't want to put it over a fire because I might pop it, but let's suppose I had like a hair dryer. And I blow some warm air at it and the balloon starts to heat up, or I just leave it out in the sun, let's say. And so I'm increasing the temperature. What happens to the balloon when we increase its temperature? What you would see is, you would actually see this. You would see the balloon get larger in size. You wouldn't see any more gas particles. They're the same five inside. You would see the balloon, and I hope I drew that big enough that it looks different, but that I was trying to draw it larger. So the volume would go up. Um, well, let's think about what we did. We kept the number of gas particles inside constant. We, we technically kept the pressure, the total pressure, constant. So on the outside, we didn't affect the atmosphere. So the atmospheric pressure is pressing in right now on this balloon. At the new temperature, the atmospheric pressure on the outside hasn't changed. It's the same. It's basically constant. So we didn't change how hard 
uh, the outside is pushing in. So we would say the pressure stayed the same. If that's the case, how did we get to a bigger volume? Well, what we did is when we when we heat up the balloon, we heat up the particles. So the gas particles, remember what temperature does. Temperature is about your movement. So when we heat up a particle, it goes from having a certain amount of kinetic energy to having a certain larger amount of kinetic energy. Well, that means he's moving faster. That means this particle is going to hit the walls with more, more energy. And if he's moving faster, he would actually hit the walls more frequently. So that's going to increase the push from the inside. What happens is when he pushes harder from the inside than the outside air pressure is pushing, the balloon will expand outward. The inside force beats the outside force, essentially, until we get to a larger balloon. Now, when the volume's big like this, even at that higher kinetic energy, there's so much more space that they're not going to that that it kind of cancels out the extra push from each individual molecule because now they they're not going to hit as frequently at the larger. So when we go to the larger balloon size, uh, we equalize the internal and external pressures again. So I guess heating up the gas particles momentarily makes the pressure inside the balloon larger, and so it will expand until that pressure goes back to being equalized. So we raised the temperature. To compensate the balloon, raised the volume. So this is a direct proportionality. The, the Boyle's law showed an inverse proportionality between pressure and volume, but when we see that volume and temperature are directly proportional. So temperature directly proportional to volume. Okay. We can keep going. Let's try another experiment. Now, let's let's take something that's not a balloon. Let's take something like a metal pot with a tight-fitting lid or a piston on the inside, something like this. Uh, you could think like a syringe. Syringes are made like this. Let's let's change it. Let's not make it a pot. Let's make it a, a, a syringe. So a syringe has a needle on one end and a plunger at the other end, like this. Okay, and let's suppose that we cap the syringe off, so we block that edge, so nothing can leave the syringe, and suppose inside are those same five gas particles. You know what? I was about to do Boyle's Law again. That was going to be pressure and volume. We've already done that. Nope, I'm going to go back to the pot. Let's go back to the pot. Pot with a tight-fitting lid, okay, so nothing can get in or out. And inside that pot, one, two, three, four, five gas particles. And let's suppose that we have a gauge. The pot attached to the gauge is, a, is or to the pot is a pressure gauge, a barometer. And underneath the pot, we place a heat source. So we're going to heat up the pot. What would we see on our pressure gauge if we did this? Well. I should actually be able to draw that. Let's draw the pressure gauge bigger. Let's suppose this was the pressure gauge here. Let's say the needle was here to start with, and it's like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, something, right? Okay, and I heat it. Over time, what happens? Well, it's the same pot, and because it's made of metal, the pot doesn't change size. I'll assume I drew it the same size. But the pressure gauge now, if I zoom in on it, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, pressure gauge now would go up. We would, we would expect a larger pressure if we keep heating it. Let's think about why that happens. Well, when we heat these particles, originally, originally these particles had some kinetic energy. And we know that heating particles changes their kinetic energy. So maybe they're going this fast to begin with, and now they're going really fast afterwards. Okay, they have a lot more kinetic energy after than they did before because I've added so much heat to them. All right, so that can explain why the pressure would go up. Remember, pressure measures about how many collisions are happening in a given time period. If they're going faster, they're going to be bouncing off the walls more frequently, more collisions at a higher speed or at a higher energy per collision. That's going to create, increase the pressure. So 
what did we do? We we kept the size the same. We, we By putting it in a rigid container like this, a rigid container means the volume is constant. We kept the number of particles constant. We increased the temperature, and that had an that caused an increase in the pressure. This is another direct relationship. So pressure was directly proportional to temperature. Uh, if you want the names of the guys, sometimes this comes up on <coughs> questions, although, again, I don't care much if you know the names of the people who did it. But the guy who did the temperature volume experiment is credited as a chemist who's named Charles so it's often called Charles's Law. And the guy who did the pressure temperature experiments was, his last name was Gay Lussac. So it's often called Gay Lussac's Law. Again, I'm, I am less interested in you memorizing the names, but you should know that temperature and volume increase together. They are directly proportional, and pressure and temperature are also directly proportional, uh, assuming other variables are constant. So we haven't done any experiment where we tried to change the number of moles of a gas. So let's suppose you took a balloon and you start with, and it has to be open for to put molecules in, but let's say you put in five molecules like this. Let's say you breathe in five more molecules and you get something like this. Okay, there's 10. Okay, when you add particles, the volume goes up. I mean, that's not surprising. We've all blown, well, maybe we haven't all, but hopefully you've at least seen someone blow air into a balloon, and the more air goes in, the more size the balloon gains. Now, this assumes that we didn't heat it, that we didn't squeeze more or less. We're basically just filling it with gas. So pressure did not change. The room pressure was still pushing in just as much here as it was here. Temperature did not change. That was always the same. What we did was we increased the number of particles, which had a direct increase on the volume. So we could say the number of moles of, oops, that's an M, the number of moles of gas is directly proportional to the volume. All righty. Let's see if we can put all of these things together, and I'll summarize. We had Boyle's Law, which was that pressure was directly proportional to the inverse of volume. We have Charles's Law, which that temperature is directly proportional to volume. We have gay lussacs Law, which is that pressure is directly proportional to temperature. And we have, this is uh, the guy who did the experiment where he looked at the number of moles in relation to the volume of gas. His name was Avogadro. He's an Italian chemist. And so we often will call that Avogadro's law. And so number of moles is proportional to volume. Let's put all of this together. If I was going to make an equation, pressure proportional to volume, I would do it just like that where volume is on the bottom. If volume is directly proportional to temperature, hmm, right now I have volume on the bottom. Let's see what I can do. If I Let's divide both sides by volume. I would get temperature over volume is directly proportional to one or two, some constant, let's say, some constant uh, we will call R. Um, T over V. All right, so I would put T on top of the fraction here because of this. Pressure directly proportional to temperature. Uh, well, that is directly proportional to temperature, so I don't have to fix anything there. And N directly proportional to volume. So if I divide again by N, N over V would also be proportional to some constant. Again, I'll choose R. I don't have to. So N should be on top of V, so it would be N on top like this. So pressure 
directly proportional to moles, directly proportional to temperature, inversely proportional to volume. This puts everybody in the same proportionality. And very often, if I multiply V to both sides, I would get something like PV is directly proportional to NT. Okay? Now, they are not equal. They just increase together. If you were to rearrange this equation and divide through by, let's say, PV over NT, when you do that, you always actually get the same number. And it depends on what units you're measuring your P in and what units you're measuring your volume in, etc. But it's sort of like a circle. Every time you take a circle and you take and you measure, like take a tape measure and measure all the way around the edge, the circumference. And then you take a tape measure and you measure across the middle, the diameter. If you take the circumference and divide by the diameter, you always get, no matter which circle you use, 3.14, 159, etc. This is a very famous number, okay? Doesn't matter which circle you use. You always get that number. We, we even gave it its own letter. We call it pi. Okay. Well, if you take a sample of gas, and it doesn't matter what kind of gas you use, well, it, as long as it's an ideal gas, uh, as long as you uh, are not changing these things, uh, if you take its pressure, the pressure it's at, and the volume that it occupies, and divide it by the number of moles of gas there are, and the temperature it's at, you always, 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 always get the same number. And there, and it goes like this. There, there are several units you could use, but we're going to use this one. You always get 0 0.0821. That's, that's if. Now, we have to use special units for this. When we measure volume, that's going to measure volume in liters. When we measure pressure, we're going to measure it in a term called atmospheres. When we measure number of particles, we're going to do that in moles. I told you we were going to use moles, uh, and we'll learn more about what that means later. And when we measure temperature, we have to be measuring in Kelvin. Okay? So if we use those four units to measure our gases, we will always get that number when we divide pressure volume by NT. Okay? Liter, atmospheres on top, Kelvin, moles on bottom. And this is known as the ideal gas law. And that, that number, again, just like pi, pi got its own letter. It was so important. That number gets its, its, its own representative letter as well. We call it R. So R is the ideal gas constant. It's 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres over Kelvin moles. And so to round this thing out, the ideal gas equation is pressure times volume equals number of moles times R times T. Okay. Hope you enjoyed that one. See you next time.